Welcome back to Movie Recap. Today, I will share with you a science fiction, atom punk, and gothic horror movie from 1959. The cult classic, Plan 9 from Outer Space, is considered by some critics to be the worst film in the history of cinema. Others say that the film is simply too amusing to be considered the worst film ever made, claiming that its ineptitude added to its charm. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. A man makes what is supposed to be a chilling announcement that they are going to reveal the secrets of a terrifying event. He says that the audience is going to learn the events that happened to the miserable survivors of the day. And shocking facts about grave robbers from outer space. Let's call him The Warner, as he warns that what happened to these people in the past will happen to you in the future. As the movie proceeds, Warner keeps on narrating the story. An old man and a group of mourners gather around a newly dug grave of the old man's wife. They silently stand around the grave, and the Warner tells us how sad the old man is. After the mourners leave, the gravediggers come to seal the grave. That's when the Warner reminds us that this is the time when strange things begin to happen. An aircraft is flying over San Fernando Valley and getting the landing instructions from Burbank Tower, when suddenly a flash of light covers the cockpit the entrance to which has a shower curtain. There's a swooshing noise, and the airplane gets a jolt. And then, you can see the boom microphone right there. The pilots, Danny and Jeff, see a flying UFO that seems to be remote-controlled by a four-year-old. The air hostess comes to the cockpit, through the shower curtains, and asks the reason for the turbulence. The pilot asks her to see for herself. Jeff asks the air hostess to check if any of the passengers saw the UFO as they have to make sure no one sees it until they have instructions. She says that most of them are sleeping as it is late night, whereas Danny tells the control tower about the incident. The flying saucepan lid lands in the cemetery when the gravediggers hear a bee buzzing. Anyways, the gravediggers get alert and talk about the noise they just heard. And, as expressionless as a newborn, they think that it is best if they leave the place where no sounds are supposed to be heard. So they escape, frightened. Then they see a strange lady vampire who kind of resembles Morticia Adams from the Adams Family. Well, she is supposed to attack them, wouldn't you think? So she moves and then bumps into the bushes. Not bushes, twigs. The grief-struck old man leaves his home forever and gets hit by a car. Then, people come out of a box with a cross on top of it. This box is supposed to be a church. Two of the mourners talk about the old man's death when the old man's wife, Morticia's lookalike, a.k.a. the vampire lady, is watching from the bushes, or rather, twigs. As they walk to go home, they see the gravedigger's dead bodies. Police arrive at the scene, led by Inspector Daniel Clay. He is told that the morgue vans are on their way and the medical inspection has been done. Then... Clay asks everyone their duties and goes out for inspection on his own. When the lieutenant tells him to be careful, he says he is a big boy, so he'll be fine. Clay grabs a flashlight from the police car and leaves. The lieutenant looks at the dead bodies and says that it seems a bobcat tore into them. Apparently, they are killed by the vampire lady. But not to make us too scared, the gravedigger's encounter with the ghoul isn't included. Jeff and his wife Paula live near the cemetery. Paula says that something must have happened, as there have been plenty of sirens. Paula asks Jeff about why he seems in a strange mood. Jeff says that he saw a flying saucer that looked like a huge cigar. No, no, I didn't add that. He actually says that. Jeff says that the army had made them swear that it should be kept a secret. But he thinks that the public should know. Then the flying saucepan lid appears again and blows their furniture and knocks them down. It also knocked all the people in the cemetery down as well. Inspector Clay notices it as well, but isn't bothered, so he carries on with the inspection of the cemetery. A vampire comes out of the church box and starts chasing Clay. This is the old man who just died. Clay feels someone is following him, so he turns his gun, and not his flashlight, to look what's behind him. Then the vampire lady comes in front of him. Then he is surrounded by the two of them. As he shoots, not aiming directly at them, they don't move. The lieutenant and the officers hear the shooting noises and they think Clay must be in trouble. They come and find Clay dead. One of the police officers says that the flying saucer must have done it. He is dead, murdered, and somebody's responsible. Then they all leave. 
As the mourners gather around Inspector Clay's grave, the vampire lady watches them. Then the three saucepan lids hover around over Hollywood Boulevard. People see them and get scared. Newspapers print headlines, Saucers Seen Over Hollywood. The saucepan lids are soon seen hovering over Washington, D.C. A frightened woman calls the police, seeing them. A drunkard doesn't believe his eyes. The army is deployed, and Colonel Tom Edwards is in charge of the saucer field activity. He makes the greatest decision of his career and gestures to fire the rockets aimed at the saucers. The saucers aren't affected by the explosions, and then they go away. The colonel tells the lieutenant that they've been visiting often, but it has always been kept a secret. They are the reasons behind the earthquakes and the great fires which are not revealed to the public. They have annihilated a small town. The colonel says that he wonders what their next move will be. Back at their space station, which is made of steel bowls and a plate, the alien's commander, Eros, and his fellow, Tana, report to the alien ruler that they have been unsuccessful in persuading human governments. Eros suggests that they must resort to Plan 9. His Excellency reads the protocol of Plan 9, which is the resurrection of the dead. Keep in mind that he reads it from a paper. The ruler approves Eros' suggestion, and they leave the station bowl in their saucepan lids. Jeff tries to convince Paula to go live with her mother until he returns, but she refuses. He tells her to keep the house locked at all times, as he suspects there's something sinister in the graveyard. Paula reassures him that she'd be careful. They kiss, and he leaves. In the cockpit, Jeff seems preoccupied thinking about Paula's safety. His co-pilot Danny tells him that it is not safe if he keeps thinking about her when flying. The air hostess comes in. Danny tells her about Jeff's advice and also flirts with her. He asks her out. The air hostess advises Jeff to radio Mac, who will call Paula and ask about her if she's doing okay, and accepts Danny's proposal and agrees to go out with him. Paula receives a call from Mac. As she's telling him that she's doing okay, the old man, who has become undead now, sneaks into her house. Paula runs away screaming when the old man is still hiding his face in his cape. He's like the Dracula and walks with his face covered with his cape. Paula runs to the 12-inch long cemetery and runs around as the Lady Vampire patrols. Then, Clay busts open his grave and climbs up with difficulty. Paula runs out of the cemetery and collapses at the roadside. Jeff's friend sees her and takes her to safety. He sees Clay and Vampire Lady. The police arrive, and the three undead are called back to the spaceship. Old Man is the latecomer, while Lady Vampire and Clay go in first. Tana switches off the electrode, and the ghouls become dead. Standing upright, but dead. The lieutenant and the officers search the cemetery, but can't find anything. They hear the swooshing noise as the spaceship flies away. One of the officers tells the lieutenant that they found an open grave. He goes to check it out. They suspect it hasn't been dug into as there's no pile of sand outside. The gravestone has fallen in, so one of the officers jumps into the grave to find out whose it is. They're searching the cemetery, and none of them has a flashlight. So the lieutenant throws a matchbox to the officer, and he finds out it is Inspector Clay's grave. Dun, dun, dun! In the Pentagon, Colonel Edwards is called by General Roberts. After several confirmations that he actually saw the flying saucers, he warns him that if it is leaked to the public, his position in the army was in danger. The general tells Edwards that they have been contacted by the aliens several times, and that they have made a computer that translates any language, even alien, into their language. He plays the message for Edwards. The message is from Eros. After introducing himself, and commending humans for decoding their language, he says that the aliens aren't upset about the fact that humans think that they're the only life present in the galaxy, However, he is concerned about the fact that the weapons that they have created are far more powerful than their primitive minds can comprehend. So they want to talk business, as these weapons can destroy the entire universe, which also belongs to them. Otherwise, although they have no intention to conquer Earth as humans think, they will have to destroy it before the Earthlings destroy the universe. Colonel Edwards is assigned the task to contact the aliens at San Fernando where there are the most reports of spaceship landings. Meanwhile, at the space station, the chief alien, His Excellency, tells Eros that he will be working alone from now on. The chief is taking away the other two spaceships for some other task. When Eros tells him about the advancement on Plan 9, that they have successfully resurrected three humans, 
the chief demands to see one of the specimens that have been made alive. Tana brings Clay, who almost kills Eros when Tana's electrode gun jams. The chief tells her to throw the gun to the floor, which would render it off. So she does, and Eros is saved. The chief is impressed with Clay's power. Tana takes Clay away. The chief tells Eros that he should sacrifice the old man with spectators watching. So they are distracted until he manages to create an army of the dead people. This army will invade Earth capitals to make humans realize their power and respect their existence. The spaceship comes back to Earth. Meanwhile, back at Earth, Colonel Edwards interviews Jeff and his wife, but doesn't seem to believe them. The old man is released from the spaceship, and he reaches their house. He pursues the patrolling officer towards them, and then knocks him down. He keeps on advancing despite the lieutenant shooting. Suddenly, the electrode ray from the spaceship renders the old man to a skeleton. They are confused at what happened. The lieutenant wakes the officer up, who is frightened. They all drive to the cemetery. Paula is told to stay in the car, but she refuses to stay alone. The officer stays with Paula while Jeff, Lieutenant, and Colonel Edwards go to search the cemetery. The lieutenant shows Colonel Edwards Clay's open grave. Edwards suspects it has been opened from the inside. They are discussing the possibilities while Eros is observing them from the spaceship. He tells Tana that in order to avoid them being discovered, they should take immediate measures. So Tana sends Clay to Paula and the officer who are staying in the car. Whereas the three at Clay's grave see the lights shining far off, and proceed to investigate what it is. Clay knocks the officer down and Paula faints out of fear. Clay carries Paula to the spaceship. The lieutenant, Jeff, and Edwards find the spaceship and are looking for ways to get in. Eros, Mr. Skinny Legs, asks Tana to let them in by opening the hatch. Edwards and company enter the spaceship. Eros explains their motive to visit Earth. He says that scientists on Earth have devised explosives and they will soon learn to harness solar energy to make a solaromite which is a bomb that will not only explode the Earth, but also the Sun itself, and it will lead to the destruction of the entire universe. He explains how the explosion on the Earth will travel back through the sun rays to the Sun. When the Sun explodes, everything that is touched by the sunlight will explode. So the stupid Earthlings must be stopped before they create something they can't control. Jeff hits Eros out of anger, and he says that it is because of such men that they had to take such drastic measures. They have been trying to contact the governments, but they simply refuse to acknowledge their existence, let alone talk about their concerns. Life isn't that precious to them as it is to humans, so they work for their planet. Back at the car, the officer calls for backup. Another officer comes and he explains what happened. When he says that Clay kidnapped Paula, the officer thinks he is drunk and doesn't believe him. The lady vampire wanders around, sees the two of them, but leaves uninterested. Then two of the officers go around searching for Paula when they see the lights from the spaceship and Clay holding Paula. Meanwhile, at the spaceship, Eros threatens to kill Paula when he is asked to surrender. The officers, Kelton and Larry, find Clay. Deeming it useless to use the guns, they devise a plan to rescue Paula with a piece of wood. They sneak up behind Clay and knock him out with the wooden club. When Eros and the others see this, the lieutenant quickly says that his threatening was useless as Clay was knocked down. Eros says that Clay's controlling ray has been shut off. That's why they were able to knock him down, which released Paula. Paula doesn't wake up fully, but starts saying, I'm all right, go check the others. Whereas at the spaceship, Eros and Jeff get into a fight. And the saucer's equipment, damaged in their struggle, catches fire. Edwards opens the hatch and they escape. Tano works around and tries to take off. She succeeds and keeps trying to wake unconscious Eros up. The fire quickly consumes the saucer as it flies in the air with burning fire. Finally, it explodes in the middle of the air as all of them watch. The ghouls decompose to skeletons. Edward says that they will return and admits that they are far ahead of us intellectually. The Warner appears again. He challenges if any of us can prove that this event isn't true and talks to you, the audience. He says that we, his friends may encounter an alien when we're going home from the cinema. The aliens laugh at our scientific inventions, and then he turns dark with beams emerging behind his back. And you are left in shock that maybe he was an alien telling the story. I'll wait for your comments on what was the best part about the movie for you. It's safe to say 
that this movie is so bad that it's good. So I'd recommend you watch it for a sleepover with friends. Believe me, it's going to be fun.